Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we got a super special video today. So, Amonkhet is about to release, uh, we had pre-release, release is coming up this weekend, so we're going to be talking about the most playable, 10 most playable, I guess, modern cards from Amonkhet, and very special guest joining me to break this down, it's Richard, how's it going today, Richard? Hey, Seth. Good to be here. Good to be here. Uh, good to have you. I'm excited to have you for this video in specific because I know you play a lot of modern, so I want to get your take on some of these new cards. And we actually have a lot to talk about today, so we better get into it. So basically what we're doing, top 10 modern cards from Amoncat, and we also have some honorable mentions that I want to just discuss briefly before we get to the top 10. So first off, Richard, we have two of the Planeswalkers from the set, Nissa Steward of Elements and Liliana Des Majesty. So these cards are obviously good for standard. Do they have modern potential as well? I don't think so. <laughs> I think we put them up here just so that we could cover the Planeswalkers. Uh, Liliana is probably a bit too slow. Nyssa would be something you could see in modern. Uh, we have Tron lands. We have ways to power out Nyssa. Uh, but even then, her abilities are quite underwhelming. And the amount of effort you need to go through just to... Uh, kind of, you know, draw cards or cheat something into play seems a bit much. Uh, you could be doing more powerful things in modern, I think. Yeah, I think there's a chance you could see them as a one of maybe Nissa in a Nykthos, some sort of devotion deck, or Liliana, maybe in an Obnixilis role. Like occasionally, I see Mardu Planeswalker decks that play one Obnixilis. Maybe Liliana could have a home there. But I agree, for the most part, exciting for standard, not quite as exciting for modern. So honorable mention number two is actually a whole group of cards. We have. Cycling lands and cycling in general. So, Richard, let's start with the cycling lands. What's your take on these for the modern format? So, I think these will see play in very specific decks. Decks that can abuse the cycling part of it. Decks that uh, can recur the lands, like loam decks. Uh, stuff like that, or living end even, stuff like that. But, as a general purpose land, I don't see these going anywhere because you already have fetch lands, you already have shock lands, and then you have all the creature lands, and then the utility lands, ghost quarter, tech edge, etc. So it's hard to find room to fit these in. Uh, the one good point is they are fetchable, so it, it does kind of smooth out your mana base. But I still think if you actually just need on-color lands, your third choice will be the fast lands from Scars of Mirrodin or uh, the most recent set or just the creature lands. So general purpose lands, probably not. But for specific synergies, I think uh, these might find a home in specific decks. Speaking of cycling, a couple more cycling cards. I want your take on Desert, Ceridon, and Horror of the Broken Lands. So are these just living end cards? Is that what you envision, or can they be something more than that? I'm pretty sure they're just living end cards, and if you see them pop up elsewhere, color me surprised. Uh, I think these are just a shoe in into living end. Aren't these just strict upgrades over some of the stuff they play? Uh, so not terribly exciting, but I, I do think you'll see these cards pop up in Living End. Yeah, I, what what Living End really wants is one mana cycling. That's kind of the basis of the deck, and these are one mana, and I think that they're better because some of the creatures they play that cycle for one mana have drawbacks, like having to attack every turn and so forth, so I think there's a decent chance that these could overtake some of the other cyclers there. But we do have a lot of one mana cycling stuff in Modern, and apart from the free cyclers like Street Wraith, we really haven't seen decks just play cards that cycle without having a living end type synergy so so one more honorable mention before the top 10 and this one people are psyched for for standard but richard you see some modern potential maybe in manglehorn yeah i think this will actually see play in decks that play collected company or a uh, cord its ability is just so strong you know artifact removal is always good but having stuff come into play tapped you know, if your opponent is trying to go off with a Lotus Bloom, uh, suddenly they've just been delayed an entire turn. So things like that really put a damper onto stuff. Uh, Sahili is coming back in Modern. People are trying the Sahili combo, and you know that just stops it because all of the fellow your Guardian tokens are artifacts. And then you just randomly stop creatures like Mermcoil, uh, which is enough 
potentially to uh, buy you one turn to get in that lethal damage. So I think Manglehorn actually has a lot of potential as just a random hate card in decks that can tutor it up or use Collected Company to gain an advantage. Alright, so that's been our honorable mentions of Cat cards for Modern, so let's get to the top 10, and starting off with one that kind of caught me by surprise, Richard. You're the one that put together this list, I kind of organized it and numbered it, but number 10, Cast Out. So, you're excited about the new Oblivion Ring for Modern, perhaps? Yep. The the times where your converted mana cost is an upside, uh, it dodges Abrupt Decay, which is pretty much the only enchantment removal that sees a lot of play in Modern. So the fact that you have all-purpose removal, uh, it also cycles as an enchantment. So if you're playing a Tarmogoyf deck, uh, you get to grow your Tarmogoyf if you cycle. And just being general-purpose removal, that's hard to get rid of. I think there's some play in this card. I think we'll see it... Uh, in any kind of mid-rangey white deck. So maybe Abzan might try it. Uh, maybe Jeskai Control, Esper Control, those kind of decks. Uh, being able to cycle away this card when you don't need it is a very big deal, I think. Yeah, the more I think about Cast Out, the more I can see it having a shot. I think it's probably like a one-of type card, maybe a two-of. It also, it just has all these weird things that make it better than it looks. You mentioned Abrupt Decay. Four mana is also Cryptic Command mana, so you can leave up Cryptic, and if you don't need a Cryptic, cast this on your opponent's end step and get rid of something. So there are a lot of weird benefits to this card, and cycling for one makes the bar really low, so so I, I think you could be right. It seems strange to say, but Cast Out looks like it could have a shot in some deck. Speaking of Cryptic, if you're desperate, you could Cryptic, draw a card, bounce Cast Out, cycle Cast Out to turn your Cryptic into a draw two. The value, the cycling value. Number nine on our list, this one also caught me by surprise, Drake Haven, the cycling finisher, the return of... Astral Slide or Lightning Riff? What do you think about this one, Richard? Yeah, Talrin's best friend here. I think this card can actually do some work. Uh, the the downside is it dies to Abrupt Decay. Uh, the upside is whenever you cycle a discard, you can make a Drake. So, you know, if you have a Liliana, when you plus one, you can uh, make a Drake. Uh, if you have a Street Wraith, you can cycle it. If you have any of the Cycling Lions, you can cycle them. So in like a Grixis shell, I think this could actually do some work. And, you know, one of the downsides of playing black and discard is in the late game, your discard is kind of dead. You have Thoughtseize, Inquisition, and things like that. They don't do anything. If you're desperate, you can actually Thoughtseize yourself, pay one, <laughs> make a Drake. Right? So there, I think there is some synergy here. And, you know, making an endless stream of two twos is pretty good. So I think this actually has a shot in, you know, the specific Grixis shell. Yeah, it is interesting that this is worded with cycle or discard. The discard part of it does make it a lot more interesting because you mentioned Liliana. That's a very heavily played card, and it's very common for people to be ticking up and discarding cards from their own hand because they want to take up their Liliana, keep pressuring their opponent's hand. So I think that's a an interesting idea. I had kind of thought of this mostly in terms of a dedicated cycling deck where this is a finisher, but maybe there's enough incidental synergies that you can just play this for value and it doesn't take that many drakes like how many drakes do you need before you got your values worth maybe three and you're feeling pretty good about what you got out of your drake haven yeah like lingering souls is an awesome card and this card works even if you don't do anything if your opponent thought seizes you with their thought sees you get a drake <laughs> if they liliana you you get a drake so there's a bunch of things that you don't even need to work very hard for because you know, discard is a very potent thing in modern, and a lot of people are playing it to disrupt combo decks. Well, speaking of cycling, number eight on our list also deals with the text of cycling or discarding Shadow of the Grave. So this card, Richard, I'm curious to know if you have any ideas of where you play this. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said it best on the podcast. It's one of these cards that just seems really broken. And a couple sets from now, they'll release a card that creates a two-card combo and we'll have a new amulet bloom. 
being able to return all cards from your graveyard to your hand uh, that you cycle or discarded seems pretty good, and I, I'm sure this will be broken sometime in the future. Yeah, it's just very efficient. At two mana, there's... It just it oozes potential. So whether or not we actually have the pieces right now to make something out of it, I'm not really sure. I know one of the things people have been asking me is, can you play this with Swans of Burner Goal? I think the answer is no. I've never, I've played more than my fair share of Swans decks, and the problem with those decks usually isn't that you fizzle when you're comboing off. Usually if you get to the point where you have a Seismic Assault and a Swans on the battlefield, you just win. So I don't know if this really fixes the issues with the deck, which is not drawing your pieces or having your opponent have a path when you play your Swans or Abrupt Decay. So I don't know if that's really the home for it, but I do think that there's a lot of potential here. And sooner or later, when we least expect it, all of a sudden there's going to be this crazy Shadow of the Grave deck and everyone's going to flip out and it's going to be interesting to see. Moving down our list, and I think this is one of your favorite cards, maybe from the whole set, Richard, the Black Delver Bone Picker. So what do you think about this one? Bone Picker. It's, <laughs> it's got to be good, right? I Like, in modern, you can't really flip Delver on a turn one. You usually need to Delver and then next turn try to Serum Visions to set up a flip the, the following turn. And if you're doing that, this is kind of just as good on turn two. You bolt their creature or you uh, fatal push their creature and then you play a 3-2 flying death touch and I think death touch makes this really good because now uh, you know even if your creature is outclassed say they're playing lingering souls you don't want to trade your four mana 3-2 for two tokens you can hang back and block you can block a tarmogoyf and trade with it a death shadow so death touch adds a lot of versatility and it dodges abrupt decay so that's a very interesting thing. And it dodges Fatal Push unless they can trigger uh, Revolt. So it has a lot of upsides. The downside is sometimes you just have it and you can't actually cast it because your opponent is not playing creatures. <laughs> if your opponent is playing Ad Nauseum, you're going to have a very sad day. <laughs> you're going to have to go maximum jank and like play Walking Ballistas or something <laughs> for zero. But you don't want to be doing that. But I think in... Uh, mid-range matchups and stuff like that this is actually very powerful bolt your bird play a delver and then go i think it's interesting that fatal push is what makes me really excited about this card because you really don't want to be playing this with path as your primary removal spell so the fact that you have fatal push and lightning bolt and you can play a deck with eight copies of that effect in those two cards, I think makes Bone Picker a lot better now than it would have been six months ago when you were working with Path to Exile in Lightning Bolt as your removal spell. So I think there is some potential here, and the Death Touch is definitely interesting. Being able to take down Reality Smashers and Thought Not Seers and Huge Tarmogoyfs is something that Delver doesn't do very well. One of the biggest problems I guess with Delver is especially if you get behind it's really bad off the top in like the middle of the game. Bone Picker by the middle of the game it's not pretty but you can just cast it for 4 mana and then at least it has Death Touch so even when everything goes wrong I think I'd rather accidentally draw this off the top on turn 6 than a Delver of Secrets most of the time. Yeah and you get to dodge most of the scary flyers in the format, uh, Restoration Angel just eats Delver. Celestial Colonnade just eats Delver. Your Death Touch at least lets you trade with these cards. All right, moving up to number six on our list, we have our god, Ronas the Indomitable. So, Richard, do you think that this is the god that's going to break modern? Do you see the black-green mid-range bias in this list, Seth? <laughs> <laughs> I knew when I asked you to do this video, I should expect a lot of green-black cards. <laughs> I like Rodus. Rodus seems the most playable of our five gods for modern. Uh, turns turns on when you have, let's say, a Tarmogoyf or a Grim Flayer or any other multitude of four power creatures available in modern. So this actually curves out into a 5-5 indestructible creature, because of Fatal Push, Path to Exile is being played less, and this punishes that. Uh, you need a path to get rid of Ronus. A Fatal Push or Terminate won't do it. And its pump ability helps you get damage through. If you pump a Death Shadow, 
if you pump a Tarmogoyf, that trample damage is probably worth a lot because people are chumping your creatures. And in the worst case scenario, uh, you can use the pump to actually activate Ronus if you have a two power creature, uh, maybe a Dark Confidant, or maybe a Wild Nacoddle or something. It can see play. It's not you know some crazy broken card that you slot into every deck, but I think you might see one to two in mid-range decks. The problem is green has so many good three drops. We have Kitchen Finks, Corsair of Crew Fix, Tireless Tracker. So there's a ton of good cards at three converted mana cost that this has to battle with. So it'll be interesting to see. I'll definitely be testing this, but uh, I expect it to be somewhere between good and very good. Uh, hopefully it's not terrible, but I don't expect it to be great either. I, I think it'll just going to be a solid one or two of in certain decks. So is one of those certain decks your beloved Jun deck? Is this a shell that you would try it in? Or do you need to be playing like Collected Company, Court of Calling, Tutor Target type stuff, do you think? Uh, so it's definitely, I think, very good in Collected Company decks because at the end of turn, you can just Collected Company into, you know, like nine power on board. Uh, but I'll, I'll be definitely trying it in Abzan. I think Abzan is a better home for this because of Lingering Souls. Uh, pumping a Lingering Souls token actually uh, is very good. It lets you chip in more damage. So I, I'm excited to see Lingering Souls and Ronus together. So number five and number four on our list, we have the, the double trouble here with two red cards in a row. So Harsh Mentor and Soul Scar Mage. So Richard, what are you going to do with these in Modern? So Harsh Mentor is probably the true number one here, but it's just a little too spiky and a little too boring for our list. But a lot of decks will just play this and it just hits everything. Like, show me a deck that doesn't get hit by this. The question is, what are you cutting from your deck? I assume burn players will be slotting this in and they'll be cutting back some of their worser burn spells. But... This is a really strong card. So strong that I'm probably going to put some in the sideboard of Jund, just because. Uh, you can just throw this down against Lantern Control and they're dead. So there, there's a lot of things going for Harsh Mentor, and I'm surprised they printed such a hateful card. It's not even symmetrical, right? It's <laughs> only your opponent. It's like so much hate on a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two body, which is not that bad. Yeah, that's the thing with Harsh Mentor is... It's obviously reminiscent of Eidolon of the Great Revel in some ways, and Eidolon hits both players. So I've definitely had games where someone has played in Eidolon, and then things don't go exactly how they have planned, and they kind of lock themselves out of the game because of their own Eidolon. That doesn't happen with Harsh Mentor because it only affects the opponent. So, yeah, I think this card is very strong. I expect it at the very least to be in the conversation as a sideboard card for a lot of different decks. And I think the most obvious main deck home is probably Burn, but there's just some archetypes. It seems so good against Lantern, so good against Affinity, and even just catching a couple fetch lands. People play Goblin Guide because it gets in four to six damage. I can definitely see you playing a Harsh Mentor on Tr to and getting at least that amount of damage just from fetch lands over the course of the game against a lot of decks yeah it's exciting to imagine someone playing a fetch land uh cracking it for a shock paying two life for the shock paying two life for harsh mentor and then playing thought seas to go down to 13 <laughs> life <laughs> oh yeah that's a painful uh turn two there whatever it is so yeah it's Unfortunately, if they're playing Death Shadow, though, because you just <laughs> helped them, but for all other purposes, it's very good. Uh, what about our other red card, Soul Scar Mage, kind of the Monastery Swift Spear look-alike? Do you think this is also in the conversation for seeing play in decks like Burn, or not really? It's probably too slow, because right now the one-two punch is Swift Spear, which has Haste and Prowess and Goblin Guide. Because Soul Scar Mage doesn't have haste, I, I would put it a notch below. Uh, you would probably play Goblin Guide first. But if you're playing a dedicated spell slinging deck, uh, maybe Blue Red Thing in the Ice, uh, Blue Red Prowess, or something like that, then this would be uh, the more natural place for that. Uh, for the this would that deck would be the more <laughs> natural place for this card. So I think in certain situations you would play this, but I I don't know that it will disrupt our one-two punch of Swiss Sphere and Goblin Guide. So let me ask you, just how important or good is dealing your spell damage with Wither? Like, is that 
Is that an appeal to this card, or is it basically just a Swift Spear without haste? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's it's cool to lightning bolt a Goyf and have it permanently small. Uh, that that could be a thing. So maybe you bring this in uh, in creature matchups. But in general, you want to be slinging your burn spells at their face. This this ability, I think, has upsides and downsides. I'd rather have haste, I think, in in most uh, in most cases. But sometimes when you're facing down a lot of blockers, this ability actually becomes quite relevant. All right, well, we talked about a couple of Planeswalkers in the Honorable Mentions, and there's one more Planeswalker from Amoncat, Gideon of the Trials. So, Richard, what's the upside of the new Gideon in Modern? The upside is it just randomly kills some decks. <laughs> <laughs> some decks don't play creatures, or they don't deal damage. So if you sit there and Gideon Emblem, they're kind of just out of luck until they go to their sideboard and, and find a way to bounce Gideon. So having Gideon be, you know, a, a quasi warship or platinum uh, angel is uh, this is a big deal. It's also abusable in decks like Ad Nauseam. Uh, Ad Nauseam plays cards like Split Second to keep them, keep themselves alive. Now, now you have a plan B in Gideon. Uh, you can try to Gideon and then go off like that. Or since most people remove their creatures and... Uh, remove the removal you can actually just plop down a Gideon and then just start smashing face and a lot of times people will be unprepared for that uh, shift in strategy so Gideon just seems to have a lot of potential and you can abuse certain cards like all of the packs you now have free counter spells uh, free removal and slaughter pact if you just get Gideon emblem of course, the other big thing is it can come down on turn two off of a Mana Dork being a three-mana Planeswalker, so that's a pretty scary start. And I was thinking, as you were talking about Ad Nauseam, it's a really good point of how it can work in Ad Nauseam, but I think it's also kind of game over against Ad Nauseam with a lot of the current builds. I'm not sure that in the main deck, an Ad Nauseam deck could beat a Gideon Emblem. Like, whether they got to beat it down with Simeon Spirit Guides or something? Yeah, a lot of decks just fold now you need to be able to handle gideon it's kind of like ensnaring bridge or it's kind of like blood moon where you know there are these cards in the format and some decks just cannot beat those cards in game one and gideon is just another one of those gotchas for for some decks yeah i think it's really interesting and it's a it's an ensnaring bridge that also can beat down for four so i'm excited to see where it shows up it's definitely it seems like one of those cards that might have more potential in modern and even legacy than in standard because of how those formats work you don't have storm or ad nauseum type decks in standard really when you do, and everyone's just beating down with creatures but in older formats you do have these creature free decks that aren't really prepared to hero's downfall or something a planeswalker and they just they just can't deal with gideon so it'll be interesting to see where this card shows up in older formats yeah and you can also oops all gideon <laughs> uh, I, I think black white tokens might be a little more legitimate now because you can actually get into the child's emblem and then get an ally of Zendikar and start pumping out uh, creatures to uh, defend your Gideons and you know that's actually your game plan and you have thought season inquisitions to try to remove any spells they have that can actually deal with your Gideon so that might actually just be a straight Gideon deck and you can have even bigger Gideon, Gideon Jura, which is also a pretty good card in Modern. So there are a lot of Gideons to help support this emblem right now. Uh, Gideon Jura is extremely difficult to kill as well. It comes in with 8 loyalty if you plus it, so even if your opponent does have creatures, it's a lot of work. It almost feels like a Karn, like trying to beat through a Karn or an Ugin. Gideon is all, Jura is almost on that level as well, so... All right, number two on our list, and this one I kind of was sleeping on, but people are really hyped for Vizier of Remedies, not because it's a great magic card, but because there is an infinite combo with Devoted Druid, which Devoted Druid can tap for a mana, and then you can put a negative one, negative one counter on it to untap it. Of course, with Vizier on the battlefield, that counter is added but it's minus one so you're technically adding zero counters basically this allows you to just tap and untap your devoted druid as many times as you want to so you get infinite green mana with a combination of two two drops so it's pretty efficient so richard is there a chance that this 
combo can actually have a impact on the modern format? Potentially. Uh, people are debating what the finisher is, but the good news is you can just end of turn collected company, pull up this combo, and go. Or you can uh, end of turn collected company, get the druid so it's not summoning sick, and then during your turn, cord up uh, the vizier. So there's a whole bunch of ways to get this combo going. The question is, is there any reason to play this over Malira? Uh, what is your finisher? Uh, but I think we've seen enough upsides that you'll see people try it, and I'm not sure that it's that much worse than existing combos. So if anything, it'll just go alongside these existing combos. Yeah, and I mean, I think that, yeah, that's that's where I mostly see it. I'm going to be a surprise if we see an entirely different deck that is built around Vizier and Devoted Druid, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if we saw this slotted into pre-existing Abzan Company, various Court of Calling decks, because it's actually not bad with Kitchen Finks and stuff like that anyway. You get to, like reset your kitchen thing so you kind of have that aspect of the combo as well plus this additional combo and devoted druid while it might not look like much does ramp you into your collected companies a turn earlier so it's not the worst card ever as a two mana mana dork that can tap for mana twice in a turn one time so I think that it's pretty low opportunity cost to slot it into those decks but I guess we'll have to wait and see there's those decks are already pretty well known and a lot of the pieces are kind of set in stone because they've been in the combo for a long time so it takes a lot we saw this with the printing of renegade rallier and people were interested in using that as an alternate combo with like a sacrifice outlet and uh Safi eric's daughter and that never really panned out so it'll be interesting to see if this combo can succeed where renegade rallier at least this far has failed in modern i figured it out we're going to do Amonkhet dot deck. You'll have this combo. You'll have Ronas as your finisher. You'll use the infinite mana to pump one of your dorks to infinity. You can have Manglehorns in there to yeah. disrupt the opponent. Gideon to keep you alive. Gideon to keep you alive. Like, here we go. We just we just built green, white, cocoa, Amonkhet. Uh, that, that sounds like a future against the odds. Amonkhet block constructed in modern. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, we've reached the end of our list, and we got one more card to go. And this one, I, I mentioned before, I kind of ordered the list, and I had to put this one at number one because I'm the most excited about this one. But, Richard, if you were the one ordering the list, where would you have put this? Um, Maybe behind Harsh Mentor. Okay. Uh, the, the exciting thing about this is it, it spawns a new archetype. And an archetype that can potentially cast Ancestral Recall or Balance. So a very scary archetype. So with its ability, you can play all of the Suspend cards right away because the Suspend cards are converted mana cost zero. So playing a Balance, which has been banned since forever, uh, you know, we have the fixed Restore Balance, but now you can play it as basically a Balance because you don't need to wait, uh, is a pretty powerful thing to do in Magic. So I suspect that a lot of people will try this deck. Now, whether this is a tier one deck or not remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that's why I value it so highly on our list is a lot of the cards we've talked about have potentially a place in modern. We can play Harsh Mentor and Burn and Sideboards. Uh, we can play Vizier in Collected Company combo decks slotted in there. As Foretold is one of the only cards from Amoncat that I think has a legitimate chance at creating an entirely different archetype in modern and for me that's really exciting and you're a hundred percent correct that we got to wait and see how good will this actually be we really don't know at this point it it very well could be a tier archetype and it just as likely could be close to unplayable and float around in the third tier like we saw all the, the reanimator decks with Brain in the Jar and the Expertise Cycle. Those decks people were really hyped for when the cards were spoiled and they kind of like every once in a while someone would 5-0 a league but they never really came into their own so it'll be interesting to see how this actually turns out. Okay, so Richard, one last thing on the way out the door. When we do these videos, I like to ask where do you think as a whole, this set ranks in terms of modern. Is this a 
great modern set, a horrible modern set, somewhere in between. What's your overall feeling of Amonkhet for modern? I say it's a great modern set. I don't think we've had so many cards, you know, to discuss for playing in modern before. I think a lot of these cards have a legitimate shot. Uh, we have potential for new archetypes, and we have potential for kind of the resurgence of tier two archetypes into tier one archetypes. So I like the spread of cards. You know, some cards are just good, will fit into a tier one deck. Other cards will bump tier two decks into tier one decks, and we might get brand new decks altogether. So I actually really like uh, what Amonkhet is going to do for modern, hopefully. It, it looks powerful on paper. We'll see if uh, we can crack like 10 years of magic cards, which is the, the modern pool uh, with these new cards. <laughs> Uh, well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. And, of course, big thanks to you, Richard, for hanging out and doing this. Always a pleasure. And make sure to let us know in the comments, what do you think of these cards for Modern? What other Modern cards do you see for Amonkhet? Do we miss anything that you think has potential in the format? So make sure to let us know. Again, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video! If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.